question or else? They can, I'm going to that. So okay. you will have, each of you, you will have, uh, so first uh, this morning, uh, the session is a session of, on research. So the four of you, uh, Megan, Mathilde, Lionel, and Belen, you're working mostly on research topics. And that's why as a jury members are mostly from the research field. You will have uh, 15 minutes for each of your presentations, followed by 15 minutes of questions. You can get questions on your oral presentation, but you can also get questions from your manuscripts uh, given by the reviewers that are all present here in this room or virtual room, or uh, reviewers who ask questions uh, before. Also, your supervisors can ask questions uh, by using the chat on the YouTube Live. And we will read their questions. Um, yep, so it's all good. So before we start uh, with you, Megan, so I would like to, uh, to thank the different jury members uh, present uh, today. Uh, so today, as the jury members, we'll have Aldi Namiel uh, from uh, UCL Laboratoire IRCAN, Paola Furla from the same laboratory, uh, Eric Rottinger from the same laboratory, and Letizia Zulo from the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia. Hello, Leticia. Hi. Hi also, I would like to thank the different reviewers of your manuscripts. Uh, in this session, it was Aldi Namiel, Paola Furla, Nathanael Guigo from UCA Laboratoire uh, ICN, Chemistry Lab, uh, Eric Rottinger, and Leticia. So your reviewers are mostly present uh, today. Okay. We will start with you, Megan. Uh, at the same time, Mathilde, Belen, uh, and Lionel, if you want, you can uh, um, uh, remove your camera and just uh, pose uh, in the darkness. It's fine. We'll come back to you after that. Megan, if you can uh, maybe share your screen for your presentation. Yes. Oh, can you enable the screen sharing? That could be uh, helpful, actually, yes. A last thing for, for the four of you, it will be really important to respect the time, okay? Time limit. So I really strongly recommend you use a, a countdown for the 15 minutes. Okay. If you arrive at the end of your 15 minutes without finishing with your conclusion, I will simply ask you to conclude. You will have one more minute. Okay. Okay. Can Here you we see my screen? Yes, it's working well. We can see to all the details. Okay. We can go. Can I can start? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to my thesis defense. My name is Megan Clampett and I'll be presenting to you on exploring the interrelatedness of different variables annotated using coral photographic data from the Terra Pacific expedition. This work was done in partnership with Terra Ocean Foundations, the IRCAN, and it is for my master's degree from the University Côte d'Azur, Mérès. My advisors were Eric Gilson and Ryan McMines. Oh. Um, so I will be following the format of a scientific paper, starting with my introduction, followed by methods, results, discussion, and then conclusion. So to start off, we're going to focus on the Pacific Ocean, which is our largest ocean, and it covers 30% of the Earth's surface. Here we can actually find 40% of the world's coral reefs, and it's a biodiversity hotspot. So we can actually find 76% of coral species here as well. And Pacific coral reefs are incredibly important economically and culturally for the people who live there. They provide food in terms of protein, jobs, revenue, they're important for tourism, and they also play a role in terms of traditions and beliefs. However, almost half of Pacific coral, coral reefs can be classified as medium to highly threatened, and there are still many gaps in our knowledge in order to ensure effective conservation and preservation. So the Terra Pacific Expedition set out to explore Pacific coral reefs like never before. And it was actually the first study of an entire ocean basin. So they sailed over 100,000 kilometers, visiting 30 countries and collecting tens of thousands of samples. You can see the route that was taken here on the left with blue indicating the start of the journey and uh, orange indicating the return journey. And if you look at the graphic on the right, you can see the uh, goal of the expedition. So they were specifically investigating the omics complexity of the coral holobiont. So they were looking at the coral host, its photosynthetic algae, its virome, and its microbiome. Microbiome. 
And on the expedition, they focused on three target genera. All of these are abundant on Pacific reefs and they occur across the Pacific. And these three genera were chosen because they show different histories of genetic evolution among the Nidaria. So Pacillopora, which is the coral on the right, and Pyrites, which is the coral on the left, are from class Anthozoa, but they belong to two different clades. So Pyrites is from the complex clade and Pacillopora is from the robust clade. Millipora, the coral in the center, is actually from the class Hydrozoa. So it's not a true coral, it's a fire, a fire coral, but it secretes a calcareous hard skeleton. So it's very important to reef accretion and it plays a role similar to the hard corals. So again, these were chosen because they show different histories of genetic evolution. And reefs are thriving ecosystems that are made up of more than just corals. So on reefs, we see lots of interspecific interactions between fish, algae, invertebrates, corals, and these different interactions can be used as measures of reef health. For example, looking at macroalgae is probably one of the most common ways, because if a reef is shifting from a coral dominant to a macroalgal dominant environment, it can be classified as less healthy. Herbivores play a role in regulating macroalgae and in competition. We can look at the benthos at the sediment to measure how it's changing over time to look at rugosity. And invertebrates are important indicator species, and they can also tell us information about reef health. However, these factors and interactions were not specifically investigated during the Terra Pacific expedition, but we can extract information about them using photographs. And photographic analysis actually has lots of benefits. Um, for one, its speed of sampling is faster. So if you take a photograph, it requires less time than it would to go underwater and do a survey or um, take pictures with, or sorry, use a quadrat and do a survey as well. It's non-destructive, so it doesn't harm or injure the coral. It allows us to capture a permanent record of an individual colony or a section of the reef. And we can repeat the study. There's a possibility for repeating studies, be it annually, biannually, every month, again, dependent on what the goals of the study are. We also, with photographs, have the ability to assess them after the fact in the lab, which saves time and money sometimes. And it's also important to note that photography is a very useful pedagogic tool, especially in looking at how reefs are deteriorating over time. Um, if you think about any powerful things that you've seen or information you've seen, it's mostly containing images. So maybe we'll see a photo of a reef from the 70s or 80s when it's more pristine compared to a photo now where there's more macroalgae, less fish, less coral, um, and it looks less healthy. So as cameras are increasing in resolution and able to take higher quality pictures at a lower cost, photographic analysis is becoming increasingly useful and increasingly utilized. So the aim of my thesis was to create a code using MATLAB in order to extract information from coral photographs and to investigate how the data generated from the different variables relates to each other in the context of the Terra Pacific expedition. So this was done through the Terra Pacific expedition, which was done in 2016 to 2018. They visited 32 islands with three sampling sites per location, and they focused on those three genera, Pacillopora, Millipora, and Pyrites that I spoke about earlier. Each photo or each genera was sampled 10 times at each site, and two photos were taken per coral. A wide angle photo, which you can see here on the bottom right, um, which was showing kind of more of the colony and typically showed the entire quadrat as well. And then a close-up photo, which you can see on the top right, which was showing more detail in kind of the individual polyps, which sometimes included in the quadrat and sometimes did not. So it's important to note that within the photo data set, there was quite a large variety um, within the photos in terms of the angle of the photo. Sometimes it was a bird's eye view, sometimes it was from the side or varying degrees of that. The distance of the photographer to the target colony, the placement of the quadrat, and just the quality overall of the photographs. Overall, 11,470 photographs were annotated. So the different variables that we looked at for um, the photographic uh, analysis were the following seven major categories. So the first one being identification. So I actually identified the corals to the species level, but with photographic identification, that's really not quite reliable. So that's why we focused on the genera. Um, because especially in, with corals, you need to look at the coralite and the skeletal structure to determine the species to be accurate. But with these three genera, with the genus identification with photographs is quite accurate. I also noted morphological cues 
especially for parietes, again, just because it's quite hard to ID to the species level, just based on a photograph. So algal contact was measured as presence or absence. Here in this photo, we can see that this parietes colony is in direct contact with the turban area algae. And um, in the code, there is actually a list of pre-specified algae to choose from and the option to add one in if it wasn't there. Boring organisms were annotated similarly as presence or absence. So again, there was a pre-specified list. Here in this photograph, we can see a parietes colony with some Christmas tree worms growing in it. And also it looks like there's a bivalve right here. Sediment contact was also annotated as absence or presence, and it was annotated as contact with sand. So here you can see that this colony is surrounded by sand and in direct contact with sand. For health, I annotated a couple different um, factors related to health. The first one being if the coral was unhealthy or showing tissue loss. The second one related to coloration. So if it was pale, normal, dark, um, bleached. And then the third one was if it showed a pigmentation response, which is an immune response of the coral's mount. So in this photograph, you can see that this coral colony is unhealthy. So we can see that there's algal growth here. And then next to it is a white layer of exposed skeleton. Then behind that, you have the living tissue with differences in coloration. So you can see there's some bleached tissue here, some paling tissue, and then some normal coloration as well. And just to give you an idea of what pigmentation response looks like, you can actually see it here with the algae. So these pink um, little marks that you see, that's actually a pigmentation response in, um, in reaction to the competing organism. Predation was noted as absence or presence. So here we can see these white marks on this parietes colony. Those are actually parrotfish bites because the parrotfish will chomp on the coral like this, leaving two um, bite marks. And then I annotated any additional variables that I thought were noteworthy as well. So here you can see this very interesting kind of unique distinct shape is a gall crab. And I annotated that, or if it was in contact with ascidians or other hard corals or soft corals, if there were hermit crabs or snails or guard crabs living in it, or anything that I thought was noteworthy. So next we come to the code. The MATLAB code was actually developed in three trials. So in the first trial, I generated the variables that I just discussed. And Ryan and I actually did this, my supervisor, we did this independently and we both came up with similar lists. And that's how we came up with the end result of the list that we used. In the second trial, we went into more details. So we added more variables, perhaps to the list of algae or boring organisms. If there was a variable maybe we thought was coming up more, we added that. Um, and then we fixed a lot of technical issues to make the annotations more efficient. So that might've been, for example, here, if you look at the screenshot of MATLAB, you can see that the prompt is opening to the right of the photograph. Originally it opened in the middle of the photograph. So every time I had to manually move it to the side, which takes a couple seconds, but for 11,000 photos would add up. So that was very helpful. Um, we also added other things such as being able to save after each photo, being able to redo if you accidentally selected the wrong answer choice and moving more common answers to the top of the lists if the list was an option. And then the third and final trial was actually the trial that we used to generate the results. And that's what the results that I'll be speaking about next are based off of. So results were analyzed using RStudio by creating pairwise contingency tables and then using Fisher's exact test. And the majority of the interactions were significant for the major variable categories, as you can see in this table here. And I've highlighted the top three in red. So that was turf overgrowth and sedimentation with a value of 3.3 times 10 to the negative 15th. Turf overgrowth and unhealthy with a value of 1.4 times 10 to the negative 12th. And pigmentation and predation with a value of 1.9 times 10 to the negative 12th. After this, further analysis was conducted by creating a generalized linear model um, to determine residual correlations when accounting for effects of species and island. So if we focus on those top three interactions, we'll start with turf overgrowth and sedimentation. We can see a positive relationship, which is confirmed by our linear model with a value of residual correlation of 0.288. So when we see turf overgrowth, we're likely to see that occur with sedimentation. And this is kind of logical because sedimentation will get trapped in turf algae, so you'll see more sedimentation, or sand will actually smother the polyps, leading to mortality, leading to colonizable space by the turf algae. 
If we look at unhealthy and turf overgrowth, we see a positive reaction relationship as well. So we're likely to see turf algae if the coral is unhealthy or vice versa. And this is also confirmed by our linear model with a residual correlation of 0.484. Again, this is a logical relationship because unhealthy corals show partial mortality, which frees up space for algal growth, or algae will outcompete the coral leading to tissue loss. And then if we look at predation and pigmentation, we see a positive relationship as well. So those two variables were often seen co-occurring. And this was confirmed by our linear model with a residual correlation of 0.245. And again, this is logical because predation can lead to an immune response from the coral surrounding the site of injury. So often when we see predation, we'll see an immune response as well. And then if we focus actually on our linear model, the highest residual correlation was from bivalves and pigmentation with a value of 0.679. And here I've blown up a picture of a Paredes colony to show you what that looks like. This here, this black uh, kind of hole is a bivalve and then surrounding it, you can see the tissue is showing a pigmentation response. So this pink here is the pigmentation response from the coral. And pigmentation response are very typical as an immune response to boring or competing organisms, like we saw in the earlier photo with the algae. So some variables showed more significant interactions or higher residual correlations, and we could develop our code to focus on these variables. Or these could be indicators of variables to create future studies or for designing future experiments. Also, going off that, from the photo data set, we've actually generated an additional data set that's available to the Terra Consortium. So this provides a really interesting opportunity for data crossing. So for example, we could look at telomere length, which is another variable that was investigated with predation, bleaching, algal contact, health, or any of the different variables that we've annotated from the photographs. And finally, in terms of machine learning. So we've generated a photo warehouse of 11,000 plus photos compromising over 10 different variables. So this could actually be a very useful training set for machine learning. And if you're unfamiliar with machine learning, it actually uses an algorithm um, to recognize certain features and characteristics from a large set of examples, and then classifies them without the need for us to explicitly set rules. So in order for machine work, learning to work, you have to take time to do the manual annotations and then time for the machine to learn those annotations. But with a large data set, you'll end up saving time in the long run. So now with my thesis, I've actually generated a very large data set that could be very useful for machine learning in the future. So in conclusion, with my thesis, I've developed and perfected an efficient MATLAB code for extracting information from coral photographs. I've identified significant variables for future experiments or further analysis. And I've generated a photo warehouse for machine learning. So I just wanna thank Eric Gilson, Ryan McMines, who were my advisors and the members of the J Eric Gilson lab with the Pacific Terra Pacific Consortium and team, as well as the professor and staff of Mares and my fellow second year students. Uh, questions? <laughs> thank you, Megan. <laughs> so yes, let's open the floor to, to questions. Thank you, Megan, for your presentation. You're welcome. There are a lot of reviewers here, so I did want to start. Yeah, so um, the next three minutes presentation, so thank you. And uh, so what are you calling uh, algae? Oh, uh, I'll I'll can't hear yes. anything. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thanks Christopher, for the warning. OK. So what are you calling uh, LT versus an LC coal? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch it. What, what are you calling LC? Versus unhealthy coral. Uh, healthy versus unhealthy was basically if the coral was showing tissue loss. So in that photograph that I showed you as an example, you could see that there was tissue loss and there was exposed skeleton. So that was classified as an unhealthy mm -hmm. coral. Okay, but tissue loss, did you include a certain surface of tissue loss to include it in unhealthy or do we you have a, a, a specific threshold? We didn't include a certain percentage of tissue loss, but that's because the photographs were very variable in the distance and in where the quadrant was placed and in what you saw. So it would have been quite difficult with some of them because they were seen from farther away or some of them were seen from closer up where you might not have seen the whole colony to determine exactly what percentage of tissue loss you were looking at. 
Okay. Can I just talk about so it would be something we could develop in order to um because we were looking into doing quantitative data extractions as well, but sort of just ran out of time. And again, with the variability between the photographs, it was sort of diff difficult. Okay. Okay. And uh, why in your uh, criteria, you include the connection between uh, different species of coral in the other part? Because I think the, the coral coral uh, uh, barrier or um, connection is uh, it's a location where there is a lot of stress for coral. And maybe this is something that is specific to really study in your picture uh, to know um, if, if the, the coral are so on. So why, why you, you leave it in, in just order? I think that was mostly again just because of the way the photographs were taken. A lot of times it was just kind of the coral so you weren't seeing where it was touching others. So if we would have included that, a lot of them where you didn't have the other environmental cues, it wouldn't have really been a, a, a valid representation. Um, but when I did include it in the other annotations, it was something I noted, especially if you could see an immune response or, or that the corals were fighting was something that I annotated in all the other annotations. Okay, thank you. I have actually a, a, a follow-up question. How easy can you distinguish between disease caused tissues and predation caused tissues? Uh, with the photograph, if the photograph is clear, I think disease has different signs than predation does. Um, so I think if the photograph is a good quality photograph, you should, again, I would never say with 100% accuracy using a photograph, be able to determine that. But typically with disease, you'll see kind of like a, great, a gradation of the coral deteriorating and you might see some algal growth differences as well because the disease typically will spread unless it's a fast acting disease, then you'll see the whole coral kind of, um, you know, the skeleton being exposed or the flesh kind of falling off of it. But otherwise, if it's slow acting, you'll see recently killed coral, kind of a layer of turf algae and then an older layer. So typically with disease, I think you can look at different cues like that, the algal growth in order to determine if it's disease. Whereas predation, the marks are pretty distinct as well because with parrotfish, you'll see typically those two parrot marks. Or you can see that it's just the exposed skeleton and it's going to heal. Um, and yeah, I think they're pretty kind of distinct because there's different things to look for when you're looking at both of them. But again, with photographs, if the quality is not good or if it's from too far away, you might not be able to say with 100% accuracy. But I think for the most part, I'm pretty confident with um, my, my annotations in terms of that. I have one more question. You use the term uh, uh, quality pretty often, which I think is a big uh, issue in the, in the Tara data set that the image quality was not homogeneous and not good and different camera types, blah, blah, blah. So especially for machine learning, I can imagine that you can get lots of false positives because of um, the, the variation of the, of the images. So if you would set up a protocol for imaging during the next expedition, what would you recommend? Um, well, just with the machine learning, the actually variation between the photographs is actually good because then the machine won't be able to learn the patterns if they're all taken in the same way. So it's harder for the machine to discern the patterns, if that makes sense. So having the photographs be from farther away or closer or from different angles in terms of a machine learning data set is actually beneficial. Um, but in terms of extracting data, I would maybe add in um, like a photo quadrant or something. So all of the machine, uh, all of the pictures were taken from the same distance, use the same quadrant for all the pictures and just make sure that the settings are the, on the camera are good so that the photos are clear. Um, and what else would I do? Uh, ensure that you're taking, like coming up with a protocol so that it's the same, you know, section of coral that you're taking from the same angle and that there's um, more clear kind of rules and then it would be easier to analyze as well in terms of extracting uh, quantitative data. If, that's, if that was a clear response, did I answer your question? Sure. If I have one little quick question, do you yeah. think that this kind of um, coral reef analysis can be expanded to a citizen science project? 
Yeah, they, I've actually read a lot of studies where photographic analysis is something that they've, they've done with citizen scientists <laughs> because taking the photographs is, I mean, again, as long as you're not like madly shaking the camera, but then it's something that, that citizen scientists can do. And then scientists can go and analyze those photographs in the lab afterward. So compiling the data and generating the data can be done by citizen scientists. And then people with the experience and knowledge to actually annotate and note those photographs can do it afterwards in the lab. Again. Uh, thank you again, because I think that to really improve in the oral, the specification of the different variables and how you can have identified or qualified different variables. So this is a very improvement in respect to the text. And also, I think that you really explain the amount of work that you need. This is not always the case. So I think it was a very nice presentation of the quantity of work that you did. I have two questions. And one is uh, really uh, related to your table A that you put on the additional uh, analysis. But at the end is also uh, the lack of interpretation of the different variables in respect to the spaces of the genera and why you didn't conclude uh, about the different variables that you find in the different genera. You have, for example, Postilopora that you find much more bleaching than on the other one and etc. Cetera, et cetera, for all the variables. And what can you say about that? Um, yeah, so for that, in terms of that, a lot of the sample sizes for for bleaching especially, I'm pretty sure it was quite small. I think maybe there was, if I'm remembering correctly, 40 photographs total that showed bleaching. And when I went through, yeah. sorry? No? Yeah, and the 45, 33 was for postilogram. Yeah, and when I went through to do the analysis, just doing, um, doing the analysis with the data we generated, I think there were just endless possibilities to do analysis with all of the different variables. So it ended up just being, we have so much data that we could analyze, what are we gonna analyze from it? And our question wasn't really to look at the effects of bleaching, it was generating the MATLAB code and seeing what data we could extract from the photographs. So I think the data I presented was more in line with the question that I presented in my thesis. But yes, what you're saying is very interesting, but again, just kind of with the sample sizes and with all of the data we had present, that's kind of the reason I chose to um, presented the way that I did. Yeah, but it was a, a way to justify the three organisms that you choose. So if you did on the three organisms or the three genera, it's to conclude something about that. And there is no conclusion about that. There is only the conclusion about the correlation between the variables. Yeah, but that you mean it's reintroducing the, all the data in a time general context. Yeah, so we're not even uh, main. Yeah. Because yeah. it's yeah. just on yeah. this yeah. data. It's on your data. kind of biology yeah. 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 And I have also a second question uh, about the pigmentation origin. Do you know? Uh, you, it seems that you say that it's uh, through trematodes, but do you know why there is this uh, pink color? Um, uh, some non healthy tissue or some damaged tissue on cores? Well, the pigment the mechanisms behind the I, I don't know exactly the, the personally, I, I don't, I couldn't explain to you in full detail the biological mechanism behind it. But the pigmentation response is typically something that the coral mounts in response to competing or, um, uh, you know, invasive or uh, not invasive, but boring organisms or something that is in contact with the coral. So tremodiasis is something that you'll see, tremodiasis, sorry, is something that uh, you'll see a lot in parietes colonies. And that's why we included that in the analysis because sometimes you could tell that it was that, but that was something that I found was very hard to tell from the photographs with uh, a lot of accuracy. So that was in the MATLAB code, it was, is there a pigmentation response, yes or no? And then the, the prompt after that, if you answered yes, would go to, is it tremodiasis? And then you could say yes or no. Um, so that's why we set it up like that way. Uh, Cause originally there was a couple photos that we 
we could see that it was that. But in the end, I think for the most part, a lot of the photographs, just again, being with the distance or the quality of the photo, it was quite hard to, to say with certificate, like certainty that that was the reason behind the pigmentation response. Okay, thank you, Megan. Letizia, do you have a question for Megan? Uh, no, I think she, she was very good and very clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tita. Um, so again, I will maybe jump back on the, on one of the remark question of Paula. Yeah. Um, just let's hold on. Um, we'll just take the opportunity of being. Ooh, you're, you're, you're cutting out for stuff. Sorry. Yep, I'm here. I'm just taking the opportunity of being be, before my my computer to activate that microphone. Um, I will come back on the on the remark from from Paola. Um, I would like to come back on what you said on your report at some at some point on the time it took you to uh, to annotate manually to uh, classify the photos. Can you come back on that? How many hours? Well, because I didn't time myself um, <laughs> during each session, I don't have an exact time. But I think in the report, I said it took between 300 and 450 hours, just that, based on working seven hours a day and yep. how many days that, I did That's that. true. It's, it's what's written, actually. And so I just try to uh, compare that to a normal life people, eight hours per day, five hours per week. And I'm coming to three months of normal workload, three mm -hmm. months of classifying photos and manual annotation. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of work. And yeah. so I believe most of your report is actually on creating a, a, a tool, and that's really good. Uh, yeah. But when I read your report, it's like you're kind of in between. It's okay, I'm, class I'm creating a fantastic tool. I have done a lot of work, but I show you some data and I, yes, I use some statistical analysis, but really basic. So I have to say I'm a bit frustrated because when you show us data, and maybe it's connected to, to what Paula said, we want to know more. And actually, thanks to your analysis, you have a lot of data. Yeah. So I believe that it's a matter of time that yeah. you have to go further. So maybe if we come back on that, it's, I hope it's not a tricky question, but. Uh, you used um, a few, a couple of, uh, of data analysis, knowing that you have a lot of variables and that you have three species. How could, what type of um, numerical tools could you use to try to see how these different variables are connected to these different species? Yeah, well, originally we were going to go in and actually look at um, some of the environmental factors, you know, in relation with what we saw as well. So look at maybe chlorophyll concentration or look at water temperatures and bleaching with effects of species and island. And there was there was tons of different stats work that we wanted to do. Um, we also thought about looking at ANOVAs and looking more specifically at bleaching. And yeah, with the stats, like I kind of said earlier, there was just endless, it felt like options to do that. And I think it ended up yeah. being more of, as you said, a timing thing um, than anything else. So we- <laughs> Did you try? Did you try something more comprehensive, something like a multivariate analysis tool? Sometimes something like ordination or PCA or thing like that. It was something that we discussed, but didn't didn't get around to doing. I think my thesis advisor Ryan, the last time we had a meeting with me, Eric, Ryan, and Alice, who is a PhD student um, of Eric, that was something that they were talking about and that Ryan was looking into, um, especially now that more of the data is coming in from the Terra Consortium. Yeah. Because you start to have a lot of data, so you can start to map and connect, uh, I think, variables which are correlated together. So you can you can start to to analyze really your your data. My point mostly was maybe to highlight really once again the time you took for that, and that maybe your report will have been more, and I'm I'm not saying it's not honest, but will have been even more honest if it was more towards the idea of creating a tool than trying to analyze uh, some data. Okay. I think you're right because this is my frustration that you don't go further on the analysis of the result and the biological implication. If it's a tool, I would not be frustrated. If you want to 
take some biological question about the right. power sample, I would say yes. I'm too sure. But, but I think in the, in the oral presentation, that's for me that came out pretty clear that yeah. the true development and that you start the analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, no, we are here oh. not talking about the manuscript. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. The manuscript. Uh, again, Yes. And again, I, I would like to, uh, to, to once again say that your yeah. presentation was really clear. So what I am discussing, it's mostly for your manuscript. Right. But during your presentation, you made it much more clear. Also, the use of some analytical tools were more clear. Uh, the general model, for example. So yes, yeah, the explanation. So for the presentation, so nothing, uh, no well, criticism. Just to go back to the manuscript, I know that everyone hasn't read it here, but I sort of disagree with what you guys are saying because in the discussion, I spent a lot of time talking about using it as a tool and using it in terms of machine learning. And that's what I focused my discussion on. And that's included in the results as well. So- not in the introduction part. You didn't explain different tools, they exist and why you should this one. At the end, yes. And so this is why you start by a very large biological question and you finish in a technical computer, which is okay. But in this case, I would like to have this presentation also in the introduction. I, I we we will have to conclude after that. Yeah. I, I, I didn't, I, I just, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, I'm sorry. It's a bit... Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to hear you guys. <laughs> so just just to, to go on what Barbara just, was just saying, I think it was tricky. Uh, okay, oh, go ahead. No, could you step on? Because uh, Paola was saying that um, if you oriented your manuscript in, in a direction or in a, in a more tool uh, development direction, your introduction should be also adapt to that. But what I want to say also is that I think that when data, so all when all these pictures were taken on the data expedition, I think that people didn't really know which kind of things they will do with it. I mean, uh, how they will analyze it. So I think that what is beautiful in, in your work and your, and, your, um, and your master thesis is that you had also to get an idea of which kind of tool you will create to analyze this photography. And yeah. I think that's why your introduction is much more Tara and biology oriented rather than tool oriented, because in fact, you, you are not coming up with a new tool for your community. It's not only that, it's that you create a tool um, and, and, and adapt it to the data you had. So it was, it was yeah, a little bit tricky. So it's, it's great, yeah, great job. Well, just to get on top of that. Megan, if she wants to, uh, to add a final note to that, and we'll have to, uh, to conclude, I'm sorry, again. Yeah, just going off of that, like the, work we were doing was not hypothesis driven. So all of the data we were collecting, we were seeing what we were collecting, uh, what we could collect, what we could extract and what we could do with it. So I wanted to include some statistical analysis in the report and in the presentation to show, okay, you know, this is the data we generated. These are the possibilities. This is maybe what we could look at. Cause I think it would have suffered without including any statistical analysis. So I definitely think it needed to, but I think if I would have included more statistical analysis and gone into more details on that, it would have taken away from the aspect that I've created this tool and all of kind of what Altine was just saying. So I don't know. I don't want to say I disagree with you guys, but I sort of do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, friends. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for your for your reading on the sensors. <laughs> um, we'll now jump to uh, to the work of Mathilde Dabrowski. Mathilde, uh, can you turn on your camera again? Hello, <laughs> Mathilde. Okay. Mathilde, how are you? Fine, and you? <laughs> Fine, really well. Okay, we're not spending so much time uh, before your presentation. Um, can you share your screen, your presentation, please? That's all good. We see your presentation pretty clearly. So you have 15 minutes, Mathilde. Uh, you have a, a countdown somewhere? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Put it and so good luck. I can start? Yes. yes. 
Yeah, so good morning, everyone. I'm Dabrowski Martin, and I'm here to talk about my thesis. I did it in Nyance at La Rochelle, and my supervisor were Pierre Marion and Thomas Hélène. The project was to assess the state of three marine organisms in the North Corsica Arbor area. Nowadays, uh, there is 75% uh, of global marine pollution due to human activities, fisheries and shipping, on land with agriculture and industries, or along the coastline with wastewater treatment plant and massive tourism. All of this can cause chronic and diffuse pollution in the marine environment, and uh, more especially of seawater, sediments, and organisms by diverse groups of pollutants, such as, for example, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or polychlorinated bisphenols. Therefore, the marine area contains more than 100,000 uh, substances, and the list of new compounds is continuously increasing, but the toxicity of most of them stays unknown. In order to evaluate the effect of pollution, my marine biomonitoring is used. It consists in observing and assessing the natural, um, yeah, the natural or induced alteration of marine ecosystems. Within this biomonitoring, we have also sensitive organisms that are called bioindicators, and they are used to observe macroscopically or microscopically induced effect and provide information on the environmental impact of the pollutants. The classical example of biomonitoring is a muscle watch concept, which was initiated in 1976 uh, consisting in the surveillance of United States region for their pollutant content using species of mussels. For several researchers, muscle, muscle, sorry, will receive the greatest attention in that type of studies. Uh, nevertheless, nowadays there is not only mussels, there are also other mollusks such as razor shell, cockles, clams, uh, limpet or sea ears, but there are other emergent species also such as seagraces, fishes, uh, marine sponges, and also worms. So emergent projects are created. The Quampo project, which means uh, quality of the marine environment in the Mediterranean port area is created. And it is a collaboration project between uh, La Rochelle University and Star Réseau. Quampo is funded for three years by the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. The goal of this project are to evaluate the water quality of arbor environment in the Northwestern uh, Mediterranean Sea and define tools of integrated biomonitoring for port authorities uh, that seeking eco-management accreditation. Indeed, characteristic of arbor area makes them subject to be um, a concentration of different type of contaminants. Uh, within the project, uh, Calvi, Lille Rousse, and Saint Florent are considered as a polluted site, uh, while uh, Star Réseau is considered as a reference site. So, in order to assess the impact of this multiple contamination, a multi biomarker approach was chosen. Um, so, biomarker of exposure indicates the presence of a contaminant uh, inside the organisms. Uh, while a uh, biomarker of effect indicate the toxic or sublethal effect on the organisms. Uh, this approach will bring a better understanding and a more integrated view of the biological um, response in environmental risk assessment. Within the project, uh, Mytilus galloprovincialis was chosen because it is a reference bioindicator used worldwide. Uh, in addition, Patella carula and Oloturia tubulosa were also taken because they are native species in Corsica and appear to be interesting. So biomarker of effect used to monitor pollution have been selected uh, within the project. First, uh, oxidative stress that is defined as an imbalance between oxidant uh, production and antioxidant capacity. Thereby, uh, catalase, superoxide dismutase, and glutathione peroxidase have been chosen because they are uh, the first defense to be involved with these defense mechanisms. Um, also, malondialdehyde were chosen because if there is too much stress or too much growth, 
uh, peroxidation will occur, uh, why glutathione S transferase and glutathione reductase were chosen because they are involved in the maintenance of the glutathione uh, peroxidase. Uh, second, energy metabolisms can also be um, uh, perturbed by pollution uh, due to the disruption of uh, ATP producing pathways. Um, pyruvate kinase was chosen because it catalyzes the last stage of glycolysis, uh, while uh, phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase was chosen because it is implicated uh, in the gluconeogenesis. And finally, lactate deshydrogenase was chosen because of um, her implication in the anaerobic pathways. Uh, third, uh, phenol oxidase are a family of enzymes, including lacase. Um, the liens at La Rochelle had characterized that lacase is involved in the human system in oyster. And also other studies support this idea with experimentation on uh, other invertebrates. But as we can see with this figure, uh, it can also be involved in several things. So to start this study, we decided um, to focus on the human system aspect, but the role will be more within the project. Finally, uh, acetylcholinesterase enzyme is involved in the transmission of nerve impulse between synapses. Uh, it is confirmed as an indicator of neurotoxicity, and it is widely used in the field of aquaecotoxicology. Aqua uh, that is why we choose to use it. Uh, now, in order to answer to evaluate the health state, health state of organisms, Seven to 14 individuals were taken for each site by diving, uh, placed them in dry ice, and then shipped to La Rochelle within 48 hours in order to be analyzed. For further analysis, sea cucumber was cut into parts, while two individuals of limpet and muscle were used, uh, one for biomarker of exposure and one for biomarker of effect. For biomarker of exposure, we decide the organisms, we homogenize them manually and keep them at uh, minus uh, 20 degrees for bioaccumulation uh, analysis. Our collaborator lab, uh, the CEDR, will analyze the organic pollutant using GCMS, while a member of Lyons will analyze the metallic trace element using ICPMS. For biomarker of effect, we decide also the organisms. We homogenize them uh, using a ball meal in liquid nitrogen. And then I analyze the activity of enzyme by spectrophotometry. Uh, however, because of sanitary condition, lab experimentation were interrupted. And then I did a bibliographic synthesis on biomonitoring muscles in the Mediterranean Sea uh, that is emitted since end of May as a book chapter. So the following slide will focus on my work that was to analyze the biomarker of exposure. All the graphs represent the enzyme's activity of each species according to location and difference between location were performed using ANOVA and Tricky test. Concerning oxidative stress, for now, we only have the result of the superoxide dismutase but as you can see, there is no significant difference to note. This can be explained by four hypotheses according to literature. Um, so it can be because of chronic pollution uh, or because there is not enough pollution or even because there is not an oxidative stress or finally because of an adaptation in the antioxidant response. So in order to answer to that problematic, we will see later uh, in the project with further analysis, such as the analysis of MDA uh, to know if there is an oxidative stress or the analysis, the catalase activities analysis in order to know um, if uh, organisms have adapted the antioxidant response. Concerning energy metabolism, um, it has been complicated to find studies on the three enzymes, because they are not really widely used in the, uh, as biomarker in invertebrates. But we can see that whatever it is PK, so pyruvate kinase, or PFPCK, so phosphoenal 
um, pyruvate carboxykinase activities were observed the same significant difference in limpet. Uh, we saw that Starizo has a higher enzymes activity than Lilrus, and uh, finally Calvi with the lowest. It has been demonstrated first that in presence of chronic pollution, PPCK activity increased because of a potential ion need of glucose. And second, another study has been demonstrated that uh, in an asynchronous uh, way. So this both study can explain the diminution of PK activity in presence of pollution. But for PPCK, no. So how can we explain that? Indeed, it's also have been demonstrated that in presence of uh, chronic pollution, PPCK activity can increase, but uh, also because of a non-aerobic pathway. So um, thereby, if PPCK activity is decreasing, it is maybe there is less or no need to use anaerobic pathway in this time for organisms. In fact, for our analysis of anaerobic pathway, so using LDH, we observe that uh, enzyme activity has no significant difference. The fact that LDH is stable means uh, that organisms have no need to use this anaerobic pathway, and this could maybe explain the PFCK activities. But the main conclusion for the energy metabolism is that it seems to have a difference between uh, sites with pollution uh, at Lille Rousse and even more at Calvi. Concerning human system, we observe a significant difference between sites thanks to the limpet again. So we have to know that LACA's activity have been demonstrated to increase in presence of pollution. So it seems that Lille Rousse is polluted and Calvi is even more polluted than Lille Rousse. This consolidated the potential conclusion made before with uh, the energy metabolism enzymes. Concerning neurotoxicity, there is no significant difference between sites. Um, studies have demonstrated that this enzyme um, is inhibited in presence of pollution, but studies uh, were focused on muscles and no on limpet or C concumber. So we will see with further samples collection of muscles if acetylcholinesterase activity could be different between sites. Finally, for the wall biomarker, we have to keep in mind that several factors can influence the biochemical process of bioindicator species. Um, indeed, several studies show that a biomarker can present natural, environmental, and biological variation. Uh, to sum up, with all this type of pollution and the increase of new types of molecules for which the risks are unknown, we need to state on the health of marine environment. Concerning pollution, our boar area are a particular concern as they concentrate a different type of pollutions. Thus a new kind of project appear, uh, aiming to evaluate the water quality of our boar environment in the north of Corsica and to define tools of integrated biomonitoring for port authorities that seeking uh, eco-management accreditation. It is in fact, yeah, the, the Quampo project. Uh, so the later has a, um, aims to use three marine organisms, so mussel, limpet, and sea cucumber, as bioindicator species that interact differently with the marine ecosystems. To evaluate the water quality, a multi-biomarker approach is used, and with all this data, a strong overview of the quality of our bore area will be designed, but also research in understanding the effect of chronic um, complex pollution uh, will progress. Unfortunately, half of experimentation remain to be done because of the sanitary crisis happened at the beginning of the project. Yet with preliminary results, uh, sea cucumber seems to be a useless bioindicator species. Why limpet seems to exist. And text where we can note that it seems to have difference between sites. Indeed, this corroborates with the data already in our possession on the size, the frequentation, or the probable pollution um, within the, the polluted site. Uh, as a perspective for the short term analysis, I'm sorry, you will have to, to really conclude that now. Yeah. 
uh, remain to be done, such as enzyme activity or quantification of energetic reserves. And for the long term, environmental metabolic approach could be applied using non-targeted approach. Uh, in fact, studies have demonstrated for the later that it is a sensitive and powerful tool that can be used to screen xenobiotic metabolisms in muscles and to identify site-specific pollution. And furthermore, other instead interest arbor area in Corsica could be evaluated using this approach. I would like to thank uh, the overall lab members and um, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, Mathilde. Um, so now we'll have a uh, so little less than 15 minutes of questions. Uh, I think, um, yes. I did. We'll uh, we'll start with the questions. So, okay. can you come uh, back hi. on your hi? Can you come back on your uh, drive and hypothesis for the project or some of the questions you had at the beginning and conclude on it regarding what did you bring and uh, did you to this uh, to this hypothesis and did you answer to your question? Oh, it cut enough in the middle. So can you come back on your drive and hypothesis of the project or the question you had at the beginning and conclude on what did you uh, bring to this hypothesis and, and, and uh, how did you answer to your question, to your original question with your project? Oh. So the hypothesis was to, um, to compare um, and also kind of demonstrate that, um, I found, no, not demonstrate, but to uh, bring knowledge is if uh, Calvi, Lille Rousse, and um, Saint Florent, uh, are they more polluted uh, or are the same, uh, or are they clean as uh, the reference site, which is Tarezo? Okay. Um, so I focus, for my work was focused on the biomarker of exposure. So I don't have the whole um, analysis for my part. And also it means the biomarker of effect. So the conclusion that I bring uh, in the results is to show you that uh, it has it um, it takes this difference uh, between sites in the, um, inside the biomarker of exposure, but because it means data, we can not uh, I cannot tell you that it is a strong conclusion. Thank you, Martin. Hi. Um... You introduced your three uh, species that you use as the bioindicator. And yeah. here you said muscles are well known, and the other ones appear to be interesting. So I think it's a little bit empty as a sentence. And you described it in your manuscript. So can you explain us why those three models? What is the specific reason why each of the models has been chosen? Oh. Uh, so we also choose, yes, yeah, these free organisms because they are uh, they interact differently with the marine ecosystems. Uh, they have a diverse um, mode of nutrition uh, because mussels is a filter feeders. Um, Patella will uh, eat the biofilms, and Oloturia tubulosa is um, will interact uh, at the bottom of the sea with the sediments. So yeah, um, patella will be more with the algae uh, aspect, Mytilus galloprovencialis with the seawater aspect, and Oloturia tubulosa with the sediment aspect. And in fact, um, for the sea cucumber, um, a few studies show that um, it can be a potential, for a real interesting bioindicator for um, bioaccumulation analysis. That is why we choose to use it because we. We are not sure about the biomarker of exposure, and it appears to be useless. Uh, but for bioaccumulation analysis, it can be a really interesting organism because it rep really represents, uh, apparently for studies, it represents really the, the pollution within the, the sediments. Okay, uh, and then in, in your manuscript, uh, at the beginning of the results section, you uh, measured the pollutants in the, in the water. Oh, yeah. That was the analysis. So, um, to, to question on this, um, how significant are those uh, values? What does they really mean? Um, 
because you don't comment really on it. Is a, a difference between 2.6 and 12.3 significant variation or not? Um, for copper, for example, or for uh, magnesium. So, what does those value mean? And then the second question. No, answer this first, and I will ask the second question afterwards. Is your answer is a blue one after? <laughs> so the um, the value, for example, the, uh, do you see my arrow? Or? Yeah. 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 For example. This kind of value, uh, when we said it is under the detection limits, so we cannot affirm the, 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 the real value. We just said it is under the detection mm -hmm. limit. And uh, concerning, um, you talk about significativity? Yes. Right. So what, what does that value mean? Is a magnesium level of 18.9, is this a pollution or is it something that you sometimes encounter or not? Oh, uh, they take the, the water sample and they measure, um, they measure uh, by um, using ICPMS uh, the magnesium uh, within the, the water. So the, for example, the, the 18.9 uh, microgram per liter is the real concentration, uh, the real, um, yeah, the real concentration of magnesium that you will find in the water in Saint Florent. Yeah, I got this. But, but if I'm swimming in this water, I, am I going to die or not? So what does this value mean? No, you will. Not. And compared to what? I, I complete perhaps the, the, the question, uh, Mathilde. Uh, for e you see differences in calcium, okay, in respect to the two other sites. In calcium, there yes. is uh, less uh, superoxide or no, not superoxide, but two other markers. So my question is, could you correlate this yes, difference with those this table, and what does it mean? If I took Calbi, I, I, I can see that there is a lot of cobalt, that there is a lot of molybdenum. So what does it mean? Could you go uh, towards some correlation that you didn't in the manuscript? And you didn't because those data are not, as uh, Eric says, significant? Or you didn't do that because you don't have enough information to do that? No, no, I didn't do that because um, it it represents the, the pollutant, but in the sea, it not represent the pollutant within the organisms. Bioaccumulation analysis uh, of metallic trace element and organic pollutant will tell us this information. And with this information on bioaccumulation, but inside the organisms, we will do a PCA or um, other uh, multivariate analysis in order to be able to say uh, for example, uh, copper is correlated with the activity enzyme, but uh, this table is just to give us an information on the, the pollution of water, but um, many studies reflect that uh, pollution in water does not uh, really reflect the, bioaccum the bioaccumulation of pollutant within the organisms. May, so may that's I, why uh, I, I did not correlate the data with the, with the enzymes activity. Okay. Can I, can I so, say uh, something? Oh, let's say yes. Yeah, just, uh, just to, I, I have several questions, but just to correlate with the question of Eric, I think that uh, because this was also a point that I quite did not understand. I think that the main point is that here it would have been useful to add a, a reference um, uh, just a reference uh, line on what are the acceptable level, level of uh, metal traces in the water. Mm -hmm. Because that have, have, uh, would have made everything clear because if all the level, let's say, let's take the uh, copper, okay, if the acceptable level of copper in the water just with the water analysis, not uh, analysis of bio bioaccumulation is, let's say, 100 milligram per liter or 1000 milligram per liter, uh, which add up, but anyway, if it's that, then it means that in any case, the level of copper in all your sites are much below threshold. So we should not, let's say, care in terms of uh, human health or in general, I mean. So, but, but lacking this table, it was a bit difficult to understand 
uh, uh, what were the real sign of pollution in the areas, at least for me. Yeah, but it, it was not really the, the goal to mean um, if this pollutant have an impact on the human health. The, the goal of this project is to really, um, really adapt this, pre, uh, no, uh, to adapt a kind of kit that will permit to uh, port uh, authorities, but also port um, uh, di director uh, to evaluate himself, uh, his pollution within uh, his port. So that's why we 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 plan to to use Tarezo as reference site and compare it Calvi, Ilrus, and Saint Florent just to set up the the, the manipulation and to uh, understand a little bit uh, the research uh, on uh, how the the organisms react uh, in polluted potential polluted sites because Saint Florent is actually uh, had the certification of clean uh, arbor so. Saint Florent is supposed to be also clean, and uh, because of Union, union uh, European laws, he has to have this kind of kit um, to under to to evaluate uh, each month or each year the the pollution aspect within his arbor. So, no, no, this is really this is clear. But actually, you do have this data because you say you state in your thesis. That uh, all the uh, all the uh, the measurements that you okay. took from the area were below threshold, so that means that you did use this. But this is, I mean, uh, it's it's normal, it's obvious that you did use sign to say if a site is polluted or not. Uh, I I mean, it's not it's not about human use. It's that pollution it's defined in a certain way, and if you want to say that a site is or is not pollutant then it's uh, very useful to put a reference line on it. OK. Petitia, you, you said you had maybe several questions. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, but I, uh, can I ask now? Because you were... Sure, go ahead. You were go ahead. OK. So uh, I have one main point that it, it wasn't... Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed reading your thesis. I think it was really clear and well written. And uh, I have a few... Uh, Mm, a couple of main questions. So if you can go back to this to the slide where you uh, measure the PK activity and the PEP activity on the okay here. So you start from the uh, let's say assumption that Starezo is your reference uh, uh, reference point because it's not pollutant. Yeah, okay. it's clean. Actually, it's they, clean. they made uh, they they follow the water quality uh, each week, and they just have to boat uh, within the the marine station. So yeah, okay. So, but uh, what I really don't understand is why, if Starezo is clean, so that means that it should have the lowest marker of pollution. Then in this graph, you see that Stareso is the only one, one that has PK, MP, and the PEP activity high. Because, I mean, in your thesis, you clearly say that these are markers of pollution. Indeed, in the, it's not the same for LDH, which is instead lower in Stareso than in the other station. So, what I'm asking is either there is a problem with the contra if I interpret correctly your uh, your results, either there is a problem in the control site or there is a problem with the uh, uh, with the biomarker. So if you can comment on that, or maybe there's something that I interpret not in the right way. Yeah, because enzyme activity are in, um, are not always increased because of pollution. They also time as, um, they also can decrease, be inhibited by this pollution, or because uh, inside the organisms, one uh, mechanism is preferred to another. For example, uh, PK, so permit to have the, the pyruvate, and uh, PFSK permit to have uh, glucose. So they are, um, they are two, uh, two inverse mechanisms. So if PK will increase, PFSK will decrease. The organisms can no, no increase both. So 
literature said, yeah, PPCK uh, activity should increase in presence of chronic pollution, not acute pollution, but chronic pollution. So yeah. what, what we have. Um, but because, uh, but PPCK activity um, is not clearly uh, say if the, it can increase because of we need glucose or because um, we, we, we need um, to use anaerobic pathways. So um, if PPCK activity, so one, because PPCK activity increase, um, it's obligated that PPCK activity decrease but the, the last thing that we 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 we, sh we we work on it is the LDH in order to know if anaerobic pathway are used to understand because uh, why, uh, why PPCK activity act like that and we saw with LDH that no anaerobic pathway are used yeah. because you can see any significant difference between star Rezo, Calvi and Milrus. so because okay, so so let's uh, let's put it another in another way. Let's say that you choose limpet as your uh, organism as your bioindicator, okay? Yeah. So you say that it's the best one. Then you start your sampling in uh, many different areas. What would you expect? So if you use it, it means that you expect something, okay? So let's say that in uh, that you see that in a very uh, in an area that you don't know if it's pol it's uh, it's pollutant or not, you see a PEPK activity very high and the PK activity very high. Would you see, would you uh, think that this is uh, a non-polluted region or that is a pollutant region? Uh, I can I can if there is no comparison with a reference site which is clean, I, I cannot uh, say enough. I cannot say something. Yeah, yeah, for enzyme activity, you, you really have to compare because if we just take Calvi and we evaluate the, the PK activity or pure PCK activity, we can draw any conclusion on it if we not if we don't have a reference. It's like when you when you comp when you want to evaluate regulation of genes, if you don't have a gene that say okay this is um, no, the normal uh, normal expression, you can you cannot see the, the regulation of the other genes. It's enzyme activity works also like that. No, no, this is clear. It's just, a, it's just a matter of fact that if you, I mean, if you don't know the reason, exactly the reason why an enzymatic pathway is increasing or decreasing, uh, mm -hmm. Then it, be it becomes really difficult even if you have a reference site to, to compare it. Because a reference site, it's, uh, it's good if you want to do, uh, I mean, if you want to do, like in this case, like repetition of measurements and say that this is a good reference site, but you, you might have problem even in reference site. You cannot consider them like for granted that they are not pollutant, okay? So if you, if, if you do not consider them, I mean, if it's not like a, a, um, uh, reverse osmosis water or fresh water, I mean, water from the tap, you, you cannot really consider that it will not change during, the, uh, during your sampling. So I understand that you need a reference point, but this reference point, you, you, I mean, you have to know what to expect from this reference point. If the, the enzymatic activity that you want to measure are high or low, I'm sorry, just to uh, to interrupt you briefly. Maybe Mathilde, if you can provide a really quick answer, and I'm sorry, but we will have to to conclude that. Okay. that. Sorry, uh, I don't know what can I say more. <laughs> to so, maybe Paula, you want to. Yes, I have a uh, curiosity. Uh, what there is behind your curtain, Mathilde? <laughs> 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 yeah. There is an armor. Ah, thank you. Well, there is not a surprise or whatever. <laughs> so shame. Okay, Mathilde, thank Merci. you for, for, for your presentation and for your answers. Okay, we have to, uh, to jump to, to, the next, uh, to the next presentation. Uh, Belen, are you here? Okay. Can you? Uh, salut, Mathilde, bye bye. I, I
But you, but yes, you can stay in the Zoom, but you can uh, just deactivate your camera. Okay. Thank you. Hello, Thank Belen. You. Oh. Hello. Microphone. I'm professional. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, yes, we can hear you well with this microphone. Yeah, sure. I have a problem with my computer always, so I bought this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Ready. Okay. Um, so, uh, Belen, just before you start um, to tell to the other members of the jury that uh, you didn't send your manuscript yet, so, so your internship is still ongoing. Okay, so the presentation you're going to do corresponds to uh, a part, uh, only a part of your, of your internship. Yes. Okay. Can you uh, share your screen, share your presentation, please? Yes. Um... <laughs> Can you see? Yes, uh, you can. But yeah, perfect. Okay. Like that. And then, do you have a yes? Do you have a countdown with you for the fifteen minutes? Okay. You have some. You have one. Yes. Okay. Tu tu as un minute à côté toi? Yep. Okay, good. So uh, you have 15 minutes, Belen. It's really important you you comply with this time limitation, and after this, 15 minutes of uh, of questions. Okay. Good luck, Belen. Here we go. Thank you. Um, I will I start? Yes. Okay. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Belen Benitez. I'm in my second year of Maros Master, and I'm happy to present now my internship that I'm currently doing. Uh, in from the European Laboratory uh, of Kodasur University. Uh, the mission has been divided into a study of case, uh, the Associate International Laboratory that has been created in February between Monaco Scientific Center and the UCA. And the second is the Federative Research Institute on Marine Resource, also created in February between various uh, laboratories of UCA. So first, uh, in order to understand uh, well the context, um, I will make a little introduction about the landscape of scientific research in France. So in France, uh, the public research is carried out by the researchers, then can um, be affiliated to the higher education establishment, including the universities. And the public scientific and technological establishment would include the uh, CNRS, INSERM, INRIA, and others. At the operational level, um, the units that are responsible uh, for developing the scientific research uh, can be laboratories where the researcher and team are totally uh, realized investigations. So they can be of uh, various kinds. Uh, I will uh, take two examples here to explain that. So the first is the equipe de accueil that depends on the one university. And the second is the mixed research unit, UMR, that had been various tutelage uh, with the aim uh, to share the competence and knowledge for the research. The laboratories can collaborate uh, and create alliance like federative structure in order to promote the transdisciplinarity and gather um, various project uh, point of view on one subject. So one university uh, can have various federative structures. Laboratories also uh, can have uh, international cooperation uh, with foreign uh, organizations of universities, and they can form a specific structure like Associate International Laboratory with the objective uh, to reinforce uh, the existing collaboration. So here is the key message. Uh, the creation of this alliance like a federative structure and Associate International Laboratory aims to uh, uh, ensure the high level of innovation with rigor in research and pluridisciplinarity. Uh, this will help to maintain the high quality of research and publication in important journals. Uh, thanks to that, it will allow to enhance the visibility and this uh, it will make possible to increase the financing for research. This is for the global context, but uh, now if we focus on the local level in the Cardassian University, this mechanism is currently in process. So the UCA is an inter-experimental university 
uh, that is pulling the public and private entities of higher education and research in Cota area. We precisely have a good case of innovation here uh, because uh, in, in 2016, uh, obtained the prestigious edicts level uh, from the French government and the pluridisciplinarity because the UCA internally uh, is composed uh, of various high level UMR and A that has been collaborating uh, for many years. So uh, that's why also uh, there are already three uh, federative structures that you can see in the slide, but one was missing in the key area is the marine resource. So that's why uh, the UCA um, this year create a federative institute of research on marine resources. Uh, the aim is to organize the collective multidisciplinarity and ambitious research on access relating to marine resource. The founding laboratories are five, ECOSYS, ECN, IRUCAN, LADI, and REDEC. And the perspective of a long term of IFR is to involve more research laboratories uh, within the UCA and outside the UCA, public and um, private sector in their work in marine resource at the regional scale. So also the IFR uh, contain research access uh, of the different disciplines that you can see in the, in the slide. So at international level, the UCA has been collaboration with the Monaco Scientific Center, which itself is a multidisciplinary uh, research institute integrating the three departments, uh, polar biology department, medical biology department, and marine biology department. So, in such context, uh, the strategy of UCA is create an associate international laboratory, response of organisms and population to the environmental stress, LIA ROPS. So LIA ROPS aims to structure the existing collaboration by creating and develop uh, joint synergies between UCA and the Monaco Scientific Center. So uh, LIA ROPS also have the scientific program in three different uh, main axes marine biology axis, medical axis, and human and social axis. So as you can see, uh, both of them were created approximately at the same time and came uh, to officialize the pre-existing collaboration. So, but remind the risk of being only a facilitator of this existing collaboration. So, and not to engine the new ones, considering the challenge mentioned before and the potentialities. So the, our question of study is quite simple. How Lea Robs and IFR Marine Resource will be able to develop new uh, research perspective over taking the administrative role for facilitating the pre-existing collaboration. So the main objective of my internship is to analyze the pre-existing situation and produce relevant tools in order to enhance the process of collaboration. Um, in order to answer the question, I have two periods of my internship, one with LIA, uh, with the scientific manager, uh, Paola Forla and Dorota Segunca, and the other with IFR, with the uh, principal director, Erin Rockminger, and the deputy director, uh, Luisa Manjalo and Mohamed Bihiri. But in the first three months, I will collaborate with LEA, so I will present uh, the work done in that context. So, Concerning the methodology, uh, regarding the ROBS, I established a two-step process that was uh, detailed in a concept that uh, prepared in the early stage of the internship and has been uh, validated by the scientific manager. The first step is uh, the identification and pre-existing collaboration and analysis of needs uh, by the stakeholders in a participative way. Uh, we did a regular meetings, mapping on actors, and qualitative and quantitative survey. On the other hand, we did a production of adapted tools in, uh, in order to answer the question of study. We did a project sheet, a flyer, logo, poster, and other. So following this methodology, uh, we realized a qualitative and quantitative survey, as I can mention before, um, because it's the key aspect of the study. Uh, 10 questions uh, were, submit, uh, question were submitted to the 25 focal points of the ROPS uh, of the laboratories and team uh, through the Google form in April. So in an anonymous way also, uh, we obtained uh, 20 responses, uh, which is a good participation. 
And here we'll focus from now uh, for six key questions to show the most important uh, results. So first, the reason to join the Arabs, we can see that the 49% of participants declare uh, join the Arabs because they already have collaboration uh, in process, but also 30% of the Arabs, uh, members of the Arab mentioned that they want to initiate a new collaboration. So it's a good dynamic. Uh, also, we can say that the 18 person mentioned to enter only to administrative reason, that is a quite minority. Uh, concerning the mutual knowledge of the participant, we can say that the 20 person participant declared uh, to not know uh, the members of the Europe. One of five, if we consider the context is quite high. So this number decreased quickly if, you, if we want to open the new collaboration. And 95% uh, of the members uh, mentioned the interest to share data. So according with the response on their expectation, we realize a mapping of actors. We animate uh, the preparation of uh, 12 project sheets that uh, were uh, redacted in a participative way uh, by the focal points of the Arabs of the, on their existing project. So, then uh, we capitalize uh, this information in a quite complex flyer, uh, which is definitely uh, more than a communication tool, uh, in order to give an exhaustive uh, vision of the existing collaboration. So concerning the perception of Lea Robs in a medium term, we see that the 38 course declared uh, join uh, to promote the multidisciplinarity. 26% mentioned to create new research subjects. 21% uh, mentioned to create new research uh, subjects. And 13% for promoting the multidisciplinarity and try to respond to this need. Uh, we did an analysis of 12 uh, pre existing projects. We saw um, a wide run uh, of diversity of discipline but an interesting homogeneity and a strong common points uh, to the collabor collaboration project between these two institutions. Uh, four categories appear here, as you can see in the slide. The biomineralization and stress response for coal health, climate change, uh, marine organisms and medical application, and microorganisms and infectious process. So those uh, are the actual strength of the Arabs in the first phase. So, and must be used as a basis to develop uh, new cooperation. Concerning the mobility um, between these two institutions, uh, we draft a terms of reference for a mobility grant uh, to support the financially PhD student of the two institutions. Um, if everything is okay, uh, we will launch this uh, grant uh, the, this year. Uh, also, the survey also include a qualitative question with expectation related to real rocks in a short term. Uh, the answer will be divided in two categories. The first is the organization of joint work. The people want to create the identity of real rocks, organize physical meetings, and work in internal and external communication. In the other hand, we have the administrative facilitation for the student and research and obtain fundings for collaborative projects. So, how to respond to short-term expectation with concrete action? First, uh, we did a uh, various logo uh, that were submitted uh, to the scientific manager, and the one was preferred by the scientific manager and the steering committee is the most synthetic, as you can see in the slide, because it shows the earth uh, representing the living organism and the society, and the waves representing the environmental stress. It's not casual. We have to find the common point between the marine resource, uh, medical issues, and socioeconomical part, the three main axes of the Arabs. So the earth was considered the neutral field. Uh, in in the all activities of the Arabs, um, we need to remember uh, the balance in order to preserve the ownership of the Arabs members. So also we did a poster. Uh, it aims to provide uh, the key essential information for all the laboratories and team uh, that confirm the Arabs to present the main goals and the presentation of the diversity with the different axes. So this will uh, work help to formulate the essential um, elements language for the communication of the Arabs. 
The poster also uh, sent to the focal points of each laboratory. Now they can disseminate and explain it of their colleagues. Uh, finally, uh, we did uh, we proposed a tree structure of the ROPS uh, for the future platform according to the suggestion of the participants that were submitted in the survey. Uh, we currently work uh, in that uh, with the development of uh, with the team of developers of UCA. So here uh, is the first web page. Uh, concerning to the participation of inaugural symposium, 95% of members uh, want to participate. Uh, we proposed um, program and contents uh, to do the inaugural symposium. And if everything is okay, we can do in October of this year. So now uh, to the discuss that uh, with, uh, and uh, cons considering the study of question, uh, we use a SWOT analysis. For the strain, uh, we saw that the ROPS have a wide range of axes of the scientific program. Uh, it's multidisciplinarity, have a strong existing collaboration, uh, have favorable geographical position. For the weakness, uh, we have a lack of economic means and financing. For the opportunity, the ROPS have uh, to create new synergies between the different NEA members and take profit of the great variety of institutions. And also for the threat, we have the risk of lack of investment by the participants. So the preliminary conclusion here, we can say that it's a bottom-up process uh, because it takes into account all the suggestion on perspective of Leah Rob's member. It is a progressive process also because we, we are at the beginning. Uh, we cannot at this time answer to the question completely. Um, but uh, for the moment, uh, we can say that uh, the internship is current with Mara's master objective because it's transversal uh, in articulation with all the sector of research. We can combine the research on marine resource and the outreach tools and the project management. And also we can say that uh, all the outreach tools that we did uh, have a positive impact according to the Arabs member. We have received a good feedback. So for the perspective, uh, we need uh, to raise uh, the participation of the members uh, after the COVID crisis. And this is the first uh, prepare well the symposium. We need to prepare very well. And then um, we need to assure a good articulation on coherence with the IFR. Uh, that's why uh, the second phase of my internship starts the next month. Thank you. Thank you, Belen. Thank you. Um, so it uh, it happens. It turns out that uh, two members of this jury uh, were uh, supervising you, so they will not participate with the assessment of, uh, of the presentation today. Um, uh, I will start maybe by asking you a question because knowing that uh, you had to start to postpone the beginning of your internship for for, for reasons totally uh, not from you, so you are now in, in the middle of this internship. Uh, in this presentation, you are you are explaining mostly what happens with the LEA. Uh, I would like you to um, maybe to give us some insight of what type of the scientific uh, analysis you will use um, in your final report. Because today it was mostly presenting what you've done. You can understand that, but I am sure, given it's a, it's a thesis, uh, your you're planning to use more maybe critical thinking, scientific, uh, the scientific methods uh, in your final uh, report. So how will you use all of what you've done and what you are doing uh, scientifically? Okay, uh, so we uh, start to um, the, the analysis of the survey because it's the key aspect, as I can say before, for my internship. So we can do the analysis of the collaborative uh, project. Um, we can uh, do uh, how um, we uh, we how um, I can um, we did sorry. So uh, we we uh, we we will analyze the survey uh, because it's the key aspect. But we need to to evaluate all of the step that we did uh, during the internship. Uh, for that, uh, we are, will propose to uh, 
have another survey uh, about the flyer because we analyze the flyer, the pre-existing project. So we want to compare these two uh, surveys. Uh, the first for the expectations and the other for the analyze of the uh, the comments of, for Lia Rob's members. So we want to compare these two surveys uh, to analyze uh, this evaluation of the project during these three months. Okay. Um, still on, on that point, uh, the, if we take these two surveys, uh, these two sur how will these two surveys uh, be valuable for both of the, the institution at the end? Um, okay, well, uh, if we take the results of this player of the analysis of the two surveys, um, in the symposium that we are uh, planning for this year, we want to show these uh, results because um, the people uh, want to, to show the work that we uh, did with scientific manager for the first step. And also we want to show um, the results that we obtained of, um, uh, of the outreach tool. So we want to show the strength of the Yeah, but why do you want to show that? Why is it so important? Um, we want to show because um, uh, not all the members know. So we want to show um, uh, to have to cap the interest of all the Leroc's uh, members because um, we want to to start new collaboration. So the first step for us is to um, show uh, the aim of the Arabs, what we did. Uh, we want to show if uh, we did a good uh, management and good strategy, a good uh, strategy of communication, we can um, have try to uh, cap the interest of uh, all the members. And then the next step is uh, maybe uh, start to do a new collaboration. For this, it's um, it's good uh, for us to uh, have a good management, show the, these uh, two, uh, two results of this survey. And also, uh, uh, we can show the opportunities in the future. For, ex for instance, uh, we want, earlier uh, want to have the labelization uh, with INSERM or um, CNRS. Um, also, we want to create uh, this kind of dynamic to uh, start new collaboration. Okay, okay, well, and um, I, I guess for to, to add in uh, before the, the teacher, I guess you will have a question. Add in. So, regarding the, the question you, you set up on your introduction uh, for your project, so how did you answer to this question? And, and currently, with all the data you have, which kind of uh, advice you can give also to the head of uh, such institute? To, um, to improve uh, this collaboration and uh, and, and, and uh, to, to overpass the administrative uh, aspect. So uh, it's the to avoid this administrative aspect, uh, we uh, want to create this uh, symposium to show uh, the results to cap the interest of the LIA members. Um, because we know that all uh, the teams that uh, work, uh, in, that uh, form part of the uh, LIA ROPS have their own agenda, their activities, and it's quite not interest for them uh, now uh, work in LIA ROPS. So we want to uh, cut this attention uh, for this. Uh, we want to, uh, in the in the symposium, have um, a, present all the, um, the results, uh, present all uh, the project, the pre-existing project, and ha have a specific uh, workshops to uh, start the collaborations. But in, in, your, um, in your project, so how did you evaluate the lack of uh, knowledge that the member has regarding the other member of the consortium of the LAA? 
Did you assess that or not? No, no, we not uh, in the survey. Uh, we have a question, a specific question, if uh, uh, the participant know about all the members. So, uh, eighty percent say yes, but we cannot uh, evaluate or with because the survey is anonymous and we cannot at this moment say what person don't or one or don't don't know all of this. Uh, this question. Okay, so how did you come up with all this idea of developing uh, posters and uh, and uh, worksheet and, and also the, 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 the meeting? How did you come up with all this idea and why? How did you? I, I don't hear you, sorry. How did you come up with this idea of developing a meeting between the members and also the posters and, and also the the little card about uh, each member. So we start uh, to do these outreach tools because um, we did the first, the, the survey, this is the key aspect. So uh, to initiate this setup to create these outreach tools um, was based in of the expectation of the uh, ROPS members. So uh, we, we did uh, with the question of, with the expectation of the ROPS member, we create this outreach tool for this, uh, for, for instance, the poster and the logo, we create first to, to cap the, the attention of the of ROPS member uh, to start to know the, the key points of the ROPS, the aim of the ROPS. And uh, they want, uh, we want to, to say there, uh, we want to create new projects, so we respond to the expectations. So in the answer uh, uh, that the DILIA members give us, we about with these outreach tools, we give the expectation. We we answer the expectation of the Arabs members. Okay. Yes. yes. So uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think it's a very nice project. And um, uh, I wanted to ask if you thought about uh, a platform, web platform to use to uh, broadcast and to promote uh, this project. And uh, related to this question is how much you, you want or you expect this to be open to other uh, European Union uh, or even, <clears throat> even foreign uh, institution. Uh, and last, so that you can answer everything, if and in, uh, in, if you think that it would be valuable to include also the participation of investors that can make money, I mean, can put money in the project and uh, uh, promote also the interrelationship between different organizations. Uh, so now I'm currently working in the web page with uh, the developer of UCA. So um, uh, we start to, to create this uh, platform with the main component. We did an analysis um, of uh, the visibility of the different LIAs. So uh, with uh, this analysis and the expectation of Liam members, we create uh, this uh, web page to have more visibility, to have dynamics uh, uh, of the uh, people uh, that see in the exterior, not only for the members, you know, the people that will see the Arabs. So uh, I hope that the web page is finished uh, before my internship, the first draft, if I can say that. So also um, the Arabs uh, want to cap the financing grant. So we, the uh, we are preparing um, the found uh, labelization of CNRS of INSERM to cap uh, the visibility and also to cap uh, financing fund. So for the moment, we have, LIAROPS have a specific budget, uh, 5,000 uh, for UCA and 5,000 for Monaco Scientific Center. So um, it's uh, the first step uh, that we build. So um, the expectations uh, of LIAROPS uh, we want to uh, have uh, cap the possibility of obtaining uh, financing for INSERM uh, with the labelization and also um, uh, 
maybe uh, with uh, this uh, symposium we can uh, um, cut or see European funds uh, like uh, European 2020 with the new collaboration, new project of collaboration. Okay, thank you. I'm done. I have no other question. <laughs> ah, uh, I don't hear you. Um, me too. I don't hear I, you. I don't hear yes. anything. I can hear you. That's, that's okay, true. No. Yes, the microphone was. Of, uh, you, you missed the moment when I asked to the two supervisors if they wanted to ask a question. I said, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, so, it's it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I was asking you, Belen, if you want to, uh, to add a final note to conclusion. Yes. Uh, I want to say thank you, especially to Paola and Eric. Uh, thank you for trusting me and give me the opportunity to work with you in the UCAN laboratory. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I would just like that it's uh, the first time for us to do some this kind of internship because it's more uh, managerial and more an organization uh, internship, which is not really a totally scientific uh, goal with no total, totally scientific goals. So it was a challenge also for us. Okay. And so uh, you missed also the moment when I was wishing you, Belen, uh, good luck for the second part of your internship. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so then you can uh, you can stay connected uh, in this Zoom if you want. Uh, you can just uh, uh, and, uh, deactivate your, your camera. Okay. And we will move to the last uh, presentation of this uh, session this morning. So Lionel, I hope you're still with us somewhere. Yes, okay. Your, your microphone uh, is yes. mute. You're a professional of Zoom now. <laughs> Are you good then? Yes, uh, very, very good. Uh, I can share my screen now or? Yeah. Yes, you can. From now, start straight away if you want. Yes. So, um... oh, I have a problem. Okay. Yeah. One minute. So sorry. I will take another opportunity uh, to, to say again that you will have 15 minutes uh, to present your work. And after this, we'll have 15 minutes of questions. If your supervisor or supervisors are, are listening, uh, they are able to ask their question directly in the YouTube live. Yeah. I understand you have problems. Yes, there. he's present normally. Okay. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen. Just before you start, um, we'd like to make sure you have a countdown for the 15 minutes. Okay. So, hello everyone. Um, yes. We. My question is, do you have a countdown? Just. Oh yes, I have it. Okay. It was not an affirmation. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, I'm really glad to present to you my, my internship on the fate of cigarette butts in marine environment at uh, Philip Morris International. Because as a diver, as a traveler, as a citizen, we are all witnesses about the, the issue of cigarette butts in the environment. And I had uh, the chance to, to work, to focus my work on it for six months and to uh, and to have some results, I hope, that will make a change in the future. So first, some key facts about cigarette butts and cigarettes in general. So about 5.6 trillion cigarettes are smoked each year worldwide. So it's for all branded. All the study and all the, um, the modeling I did was for 
all branded, not only Philip Morris International. What we know, we know that um, like there is a high prevalence of cigarette butt in coastal cleanup. Like some organization like uh, Ocean Conservancy, they did a lot of statistics about it, and they they found all the time like cigarette butt are the first item found. Then we have some data about the toxicity of cigarette butt in lab, so lethal concentration, for example, or no observation effect concentration. It's pretty well studied. We have some study about the degradability uh, on soil. Nothing uh, more on, in marine water, so it's very few about it. And we don't have any information about the transfer from the land to the ocean. We, we know how much we, we smoke cigarette butt, but we don't know how much finish in the, in the sea. So at the beginning of my, my internship, I tried to, to define the question and to define the profile of cigarette butt in the marine environment. So first question is the quantification. How to quantify the transfer from the land to the sea? How much are present in land? Then uh, there are geographical origin. Where are they present? Where are they emitted? The mechanism, uh, for example, some basic question, but we don't know if the cigarette butt will float or sink. So it's amazing the, the lack of information we have in that domain. Even if it's well detailed, of course, for plastic, it's not so much detail for, for cigarette butt. The, the duration is really important because we, we, we don't know how much it takes in the, in the marine environment to degrade it. And uh, as I say, the toxicity from in the lab uh, has to be transferred to the, to the environment. So we know how much is the toxicity in one liter, but we don't know if we transfer it with the global consumption of cigarettes in the world. So I divided my, my, uh, my internship in four topics. And uh, I will present, I will save time and I will present the most interesting part. So one, the first um, part I will present is the modeling. So I did a large review about plastic uh, in the ocean and I proposed the modeling. Uh, and I will present it. I did uh, in a small experimentation, basic experimentation about the flotability to complete my, uh, the large review I did about uh, plastic in the ocean. And I will present you some uh, conclusion. I will not present degradability. I will present just uh, an application of the modeling I developed uh, to, to show you the, the utilization we can make, make with my, my model. So first, the idea was to define uh, how plastic has, are transfer to, I, I did a review about the transfer from plastic from the land to the ocean. One of the main study is about, it's by Jan Beck in 2015. And they, they propose uh, a first ratio of 25% within 50 kilometers of the coast. It's the main study. Uh, the, um, but in the second time, uh, in 2017, another study studies the concentration, the correlation between plastic in the river and the mismanagement of waste in the watershed, so in the river catchment. And they propose to develop um, empirical ratio to estimate the transfer uh, depending on ideological condition. At the same time, another study say, okay, we should add the seasonality and we should add the rainfall and uh, the, the catchment runoff. And in 2020, like in February this year, I was doing my internship and Bouché and Al uh, working for uh, the EUCN, they proposed to combine it and to say, okay, we can propose ratio depending on the catchment runoff value and the distance to the coast. So it's empirical ratio based on these studies. So what I did is say, okay, I will estimate uh, the source of cigarette butt in the world. And it's based on the conception of tobacco per country, of course, but also it's distributed, distributed depending on the density of population. Then uh, I use scientific studies to estimate the rate of littering on the ground of cigarette butt. And I had from Jen Beck, the first study, the rate of mismanagement waste. So from this point, I have a, a map of the distribution of cigarette butt. And I can estimate with physical uh, data the, the release weight, so the quantity, the ratio of the transfer. And I use, so a reverse check file um, 
open source run of data. We have a lot of data, open data about it. The release rate matrix by, um, by uh, Boucher and Hall. And then we competed in a uh, geoprocessing tool, so in GIS, GIS, and we can obtain the first study in the world about the transfer of cigarette butt in the ocean. Like it's for almost uh, 45,000 region. And we obtain the, the input by region. So as you can see, some result. Um, we estimated that 3.2 trillion per year of cigarette butt are released in the environment, so inland, on the ground. Uh, a big uh, hotspot is in Asia because we have like 75% of cigarette butt released in India. Um, and China accounts only for almost 50%. So uh, as you can see, it's really concentrated in Asia. Um, then the release rate um, was calculated. So you can observe the map with the different release rate. With mainly, we, we have high release rate uh, in Amazonia, for example. Of course, it depends on the rainfall. So area with high rainfall have a high release rate. In Asia too, uh, in India, in uh, some place we, where you have monsoon. And also high release rate, but in area where we have less density of population. The average release rate is around 6%, so for the entire world. So if we combine the source and the release rate, we obtain a map of the input uh, in the ocean, into the ocean. So we estimated that 219 billion per year are released in the ocean. So it's 4% of the sales. Uh, Asian country I even more represented because the release rate is more important. So we have 82% in Asia. And we know now that only eight countries uh, represent 80% of the input in the ocean. So uh, here, uh, an example of more detailed map, and we can see the size of the, of the region depending on the, the country. Um, so what can we do with this model? First, we can't go anywhere, uh, everywhere to monitor uh, in Amazonia, to monitor everywhere in Asia. So we have a powerful model to estimate the littering, the improper management of cigarette butt, and the input for all the world. So that's really powerful for that. Uh, we have a release rate of average release rate of 6%. So actually, it corresponds almost to the 25% within 50 kilometers of Jambek. We obtain the, the same amount of 200 billion uh, input in the ocean. And it's average with the other studies between 10 and 3%. So with that, we can, it's really interesting to, to propose new anti-littering program focusing on the, 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 the biggest emitter of cigarette butt into the ocean. And we know by other studies that the, the consumption and the, and the littering is concentrated in urban centers. So it's, it's a help to focus all the means uh, to this region. So one application uh, we can do with my model is to estimate the toxicity um, in the runoff effluent all around the world. So I chose to, to present um, the city of Shanghai, because we have a formula proposed by studies that studies the leaching of the main pollutant, the nicotine, uh, depending on the quantity of rain. So we can use this formula. So for the city of Shanghai, I estimated for um, a dry period of 19 days. It was the longest in 2019. So I have more than 2 billion uh, cigarette butts on the ground. And then here on the graph, uh, we can observe the curve of the concentration of nicotine in the, in the effluent, in the run of water. So it's, it starts at 170 uh, milligram per cubic meter, and it will decrease if the grain continue. So these values are the concentration in the urban effluent, in the run of water. So it's before dilution of, uh, in the aquatic environment. And of course, there is hydrological condition everywhere in the world, different um, hydrochloric, 
hydro so uh, we can uh, compare it to the value uh, in North Spain, which are measured in the river or no, in the urban runoff, and we have the same of the uh, the same of the uh, like 32.5 milligram per cubic meter. So it, it's coherent with our model. What we can say is that the toxicity value. Uh, at the beginning, uh, higher than the no effect concentration for Daphnia, for example. So it's a good indication. Uh, then we can, I estimated the behavior of uh, cigarette butt as marine litter. So I did this small test, but which had not been before, which, which was not this, uh, available in the literature. And we observe that uh, cigarette butt will sink in fresh water and in seawater between few minutes to until two weeks in the seawater. It depends if the, the cigarette butt is scratched or not. So what we can assume is that the cigarette butt will uh, entrap air at the beginning and then uh, will sink prog progressively. So if we compare it with the literature available and the uh, about plastic in general. So here we are talking about macroplastic. So the cigarette butt is in shapes. So it's more than five millimeter. So the cigarette butt is complete. Um, we know that 20% of the items are on the coastline. So cigarette butt are present on the coastline. Uh, we have few, few observation of interaction with the biota uh, in the literature. There will we don't have observation in the sea surface, so probably they will sink uh, to the bottom. And they will be present in the water column. For example, we have an interaction, an observation of interaction with the whale shark. So it's possible they will sink progressively, and then the sea, the sea floor will be a sink for cigarette butt. But on the floor, I will change the slide. So now we are talking about microplastic. So they will degrade uh, on the floor and they will produce fiber. And we don't have a lot of observation of fiber of cellulose acetate. Uh, probably because it's a cellulose-based uh, fiber and it's not so much interesting for researchers, and, but also for, for methodological reason. So I found two studies, uh, one in sea ice, uh, where they found cellulose acetate. So sea ice is related to, uh, it's drifting sea ice, so it's related to surface, to, to um, water from the surface. So we can estimate that cellulose acetate uh, is present in the surface. We found, also, I found also, also another study with different methodological uh, that uh, shown that cellulose acetate is present in marine aggregate. So they are present in the water column. So probably they are distributed all over uh, the ocean from the seafloor to the coastline, even if the, if the density of uh, cellulose acetate is higher than the seawater. So as a conclusion, what we can say, we can say we have, I developed a powerful tool to, to permit to develop more efficient um, campaign of anti-littering. So that's really good for that. We can target hotspots mainly uh, in urban area in Asia. We know that eight countries represent only uh, represent 80 percent of the of the input. So maybe it's a good uh, it's a good news because we can focus on these countries and to and reduce a lot. We have now a better understanding of the concentration of cigarette butts in the environment. So we, we, we understand better yet. And uh, what I can propose also is to better study the decomposition, the degradation of cigarette but in the water and to study the fiber that are produced and um, to, to better understand, to better monitor uh, them. And to also study the toxicity, their toxicity, because we don't know much about, about it at that time. So some references here. And uh, thank you for your attention. If you have questions, uh, it's with pleasure. It will be our pleasure as well. <laughs> um, so you have several uh, reviewers here. Um, maybe we can start with Adin. I can see your hand. So 
what are you calling a model in your study? In your uh, so, sorry, I didn't understand. What are you calling your model in your study? I have I have two models. I have the model. Uh, it's an estimation of the ratio of, of um, input in the in the in the environment. Then I have the second model. I have model one, which is this one, or this one. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lionel, I, I allow myself to interrupt. It's just that uh, Aldino uh, hasn't read your manuscript. Okay. And so you have to go really fast. Maybe I would like to introduce first the questions. I have been a happy reader of your manuscript, a really dense and long manuscript. So a lot of things have been done by Lionel. So that's clear. So you had really to cut a lot. Maybe Lionel, you could come back, take a few minutes to reintroduce how you have conceived your model. So the model, uh, how, you, how you calculate the improper management, how you calculate the release rates, the different steps. Yeah, so maybe we have to start from the matrix, uh, the matrix of... Um, um, like this matrix. Um, I found in the, in the study of Le Boucher of the EUCN, a matrix uh, giving empirical um, ratio of the release from the land to the ocean. So you can see here there is a distance to the shore, and here we have the um, runoff water. So if you have like if you are between 10 and 50 kilometers, 50 kilometers, yeah, uh, you have different ratio combined with, for example, more than 0.8 millimeter per day. And then you have the ratio um, of release into the ocean. So I have the opportunity. Uh, cigarette butts are com uh, compared to, to other plastic uh, calibrated. They are unique. Like we, they, people smoke five trillion of cigarettes, but they are all the same. So and I have data about it. So I decided to estimate as a the quantity of cigarette smoke depending on the density of population. And then from it, I can have, uh, yes, with it. So I have the sale of tobacco per country. Per country. Can, can, yes. Can you put full screen your, your slide, please? Ah, okay. It's too small. So I have the sale per country. I say, okay, 50, I have, I have one study only we said, okay, people are smoking 50% indoor, 50% outdoor. So I have this ratio. So 50% of the cigarettes are smoked outdoor. I have some ratio of estimation in high, high income country. So 60%, the rate littering ratio is 60% in, uh, for example, in France. I don't have data in China, so I, I decided to choose 100%. Then I estimated ratio of treat littering rate. So I don't have too much data about it. Uh, I, I, we have some data in, in the literature of Philip Morris, but not so much. So at the end, I have a ratio of cigarette butt littering. But that's not all because people are smoking indoor. So we consider that if you smoke indoor, you will put your cigarette in a, in a, in a bin. So then I have mismanagement rate from a study from Jan Beck with for all the world. So that, for example, uh, in Japan, it's 0% of mismanaged waste. In China, it's 80%. So, um, so I, if I combine it, I have uh, an improper man management rate of cigarette butt. So it's a combination of the cigarette uh, butt not managed by the authorities and the cigarette butt uh, littered by people. And with that, I have, I use it, I, uh, I will show you. Um, so I obtained this map. So it's the first map with the global data uh, of improper, no, it's, yeah. Sorry, it's not this one. Well, this one is okay. Uh, I have this. So it's all the, the, the cigarette butt improperly managed. 
So finishing on the ground in the environment. So from that, I use the matrix I saw before. And, uh, and also, um, open data about hydrological condition. I don't find it because I have a lot of additional slides. Yes, here. Yeah. So I have data about administrative region. I have data about the runoff water all around the world. I have the, 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 the river shape file. So we know where are the river. And we have the density of population. So with that, we are able to, to estimate, um, I will show you. For each region, we will find the center point. We have a center point like this. This is a region, it's Bulgaria, okay? We have a center point for each river and we will calculate it comp uh, using this map, the, the, the release rate ratio for each region. And then we have the region, the population. So if you have the population and the, the consumption for the country, we have the number of cigarettes consumed in the region. And then we have the distance to the sea and we have the, the rainfall with the runoff data. And so we can calculate the release rate for the region. So the model is not, it's an approximation. It permits to compare region. Uh, the idea is to say, okay, we, we have a means to, to conduct an anti litering campaign. Where should I go? So with that, we, we are able to, to compare the region. And okay. in Asia or for the entire world. Okay, maybe Adin, if you want to. Uh, it's okay. Uh, no, can this topic, may, I, may I, I ask a question? Do you plan or did you, because I didn't read your the report, taking account the educational level of each country and the littering capacity? on each country in respect to the that uh, release? Yes. Uh, actually, I use the study of Jambeck of uh, 2015. Uh, it's based, um, I have to find a good slide. Uh, actually, we yeah. have. So the study of Jambeck in 2015, they propose to categorize uh, the, the country by income. So we have four categories, high income, middle, middle uh, upper income, middle lower income, and lower income. So, and we have a mismanagement uh, rate per country by the, by the World Bank. So what the World Bank calculated it and um, you know, stop searching for sites, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so after, we don't have a lot of I have found like four studies, four studies, four studies about the littering by people. And it's in US, New Zealand, France, no, two in France. So I was able only to estimate um, a ratio for high income country, as you can see here. The, the four categories. So that's a limitation because but it's a lot of work to go in every country and to ask to people. But I consider that in the lot of countries, probably the rate of littering is 100% because they don't consider cigarette butt as littering. Okay, Lionel, I'm jumping on that. Uh, so I think this, this table is... Uh, is your table two in your manuscript. And yes. so you assume that all countries with an income between low to middle high have litter rates of 100 persons. Yes. And so could you explain a bit how you your arrived to that assumption? Is it based on the education uh, level that Arla was talking about? Um, it's I, like we don't have data. I didn't find studies. I found one study in the Bahrain, uh, but in, it, it's a dictature. Yeah, so okay. it's, Sorry that, but what, what's the point of 100? Is it to, to be sure to not underestimate? Yes, exactly. It, it was uh, to be sure to, to not underestimate. Okay. 
Can I can I ask a question? Of course, it's a... Okay, thank you. Uh, I also didn't read your manuscript, so sorry if I ask something that it's in there. So it's a, yeah. it's a very interesting study, and I I wonder uh, if. Uh, if you consider extreme cases, like, for example, Singapore, which is also a dictature, and we know that in Singapore, uh, smoking is not allowed almost everywhere. I mean, there are only very small spots and controlled spots so where smoking is allowed, outdoor and indoor, and of course, in your home place, you, you can do it, but I mean, it will not litter the environment. So I wonder if you thought about using uh, Singapore as, uh, um, as a, let's say, an example to test your model on the uh, on how much is uh, has a good performance on uh, let's say extreme case lower and higher cases of pollution. Yeah, uh, we didn't consider Singapore because as a conception is not enough relevant. So, but Jap it's the same case in Japan actually. Because in Japan, it's now banned to smoke in the street. So, but we don't have study about it. So, we made an exception for 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 Japan, and we consider that ninety percent of the cigarette butts are, are smoked indoor, and only five percent are smoked outdoor. So, it's decreased a lot the the littering rate. But yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know exactly for for Singapore, but it's clearly uh, we can we have different means to to develop uh, monitoring to confirm the model. So maybe in Singapore, but we are working here in Switzerland with a company uh, using drone and using camera to 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 count the the number of cigarette butts on the ground. So. We are working with different companies, yes, to, to, to develop the monitoring. And I think, of course, we have a model. So if we have input from, from, uh, from uh, like monitoring like uh, the, the different company, we can adjust the model more and more to, to be more precise. Okay. So it was the first global approach. But yes, there is small uh, specificity. But sometimes it was like not relevant because too small like for Singapore. But for Japan, it was like Japan is in the top 10 if I consider 50% uh, smoking outdoor indoor. And it's not really the case. So we adapted, we adjusted. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have time for another very quick question? Okay, yes, so you said, nice. that, you said that the main component of uh, degradation uh, of the cigarette buds, it's uh, cellulose acetate. But yes. do you know if cellular, um, cellulose acid is, I guess it's, uh, it's pretty common also to other kind of plastics or it's not, or it's something very specific for uh, cigarette butts? Uh, uh, cellulose acetate is more than 80%, uh, even 90% cigarette but You have some other utilization, like for glasses, mm -hmm. uh, because you have some good properties, but we know exactly the ratio uh, between the production for cigarette butt and the production for other material. So if we find it, yeah. So, but probably that in the sea, if we found cellulose acetate, it's mainly because of uh, cigarette butt and not because of the littering of glasses, probably. But it's difficult. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, first a comment. Uh, I read your manuscript. It was very dense, very interesting, sometimes a little bit overwhelming. So I really appreciated how you tried to condense your, your presentation today to pick up some of the main messages. And then yeah. through the questions, you were able to, to go back and, and use some of the, uh, uh, the explanations how you, you went there. Um, I have uh, one question. What is your statistical relevance of the sinking uh, cigarette butt uh, experiment that you performed? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we had we had like five. Uh... Don't need to show the slide. No, 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 just yeah. to answer. You don't need the slides. Oh, the the sample was like. Uh... 
five per type. So we had five uh, not crush because we consider that cigarette butts, most of the time people threw it on the ground and they crush with the feet. It, so it's, it, the, the cigarette butt will not enter the same quantity of air. So we have two cases without crushing it and with crush and with, with cigarette butt crushed. So we have five, we had five per type. Uh, five crush, five not crush in fresh water, five not crush in seawater, and five crushed in seawater. So it's not a lot, but it gives an idea and about the fate on the long term. How would you define this type of result? So, if, if it's relevant, significative, you mean? Yes. Uh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't do the statistical analysis of it. Ah, yeah. Maybe better we start. I can't because I have two questions on your on your cigarette butts experiment. Uh, the first one is really why. Uh, I mean. You spend, I think, really a lot of time for your for your model, and I yeah. think honestly, it's great work. And I don't really know, I don't really understand why you took the time to do this cigarette thing, or even if you took it because you were curious, or maybe your supervisors were asking this to you. I think it's interfering with the message of your manuscript and of your oral presentation, because um, I guess, no, no, you know, yeah. if you want to show some fact, something. Uh, after two years of master, you, you know how to design an experiment, and at least you should use replicates. So I'm sure you will have more becher, more flask uh, to be used uh, in, in your lab. So yeah. you will at least use replicates for each, each treatment. So yeah, my course, question yeah. is really, I, I think you, understood, you, you answered it because you were curious, maybe because you wanted to do it, but. It's not to answer a question I think that was never answered before. If you want to answer that question, you have to do a, a relevant experimental design. Yeah. Or say that it's very preliminary data that yeah. needs to be followed up. That was my point when I asked you. I think it's really interesting preliminary data that you have. Yes. But it leads me to a question. Because uh, on, your, uh, on your figure 15, don't show us again. It's a, it's a figure when you have the different uh, flask with the cigarette butts. And at some point, it's changing the color of the liquid. It's becoming really uh, yellow. Yes. At the, at the end of your manuscript, there is a really big part where you're trying to connect uh, the result of your model with ecological consequences. And at some point, you're talking about uh, heavy metals and a lot of other types of contaminants. Yes. Because you're curious to do this experiment, do you know what is the reason of the color yellow? Is it something which is also uh, um, also harmful for the environment? Uh, what about this yellow color? Um, I don't know the, the yellow color. The main compound found in the water after uh, immersion is nicotine. So I guess it's nicotine. It's uh, so. For the harmful level, we know that the lethal concentration is um, one cigarette butt in the in one liter of um, if uh, of one liter of water is enough to kill fifty percent of um, the fish. So we already know that the toxicity in one liter is high. The the interest of my uh, my study was to compare it with hydrological condition in the environment. Okay. Because actually you never have only one liter, we are, you never have one cigarette butt in one liter. You have dilution, you have a different factor. So, and yeah, when, when, when they come in the studies, when they communicate about the, the concentration and the lethal concentration, they communicate about really high level that not representative of the level in the in the environment. So my, my proposition was to say, okay, it will be better to study at higher level. Because what they do in the lab is to put one one cigarette butt in the in the, in one liter. It's easy. You can you can observe the effect. But it would be even better to to analyze uh, closer to the no effect concentration 
Like, so that's what the interest. Okay. Yeah. But don't you think that the brown uh, color? Sorry. 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 Because you know uh, when you dry, I mean tobacco is plant, and when you dry it, you see it's, 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 the, it's, uh, it's only the the yeah, oh, it's okay, the I it was the, the remain, yeah. but it's it's going into the filter. So yeah, I'm not sure it's really. Oh, it's uh, just like uh, running. Okay, thank you. I have yeah, two, two, two questions. Okay. okay. One is, okay. do you really think that you can convince to do an anti littering campaign in China? Using your model, so that's a very uh, specific aspect of your of your project. Not only not only China, but uh, let's say Asia in general. Uh, so there is a case of uh, Philip Morris International. They are not they are present everywhere, but not in China, because uh, it's uh, the authorities uh, control the market in China. But for example, in Indonesia, it's sure that they, they will try to put more means on in Indonesia than in other countries. Uh, and after, of, of, of course, after it's difficult to, to act in a country of 1 billion people. So, but it's what we have to do if we want to change uh, that thing. Yeah. But, but uh, instead of acting on the country itself, it's, I think, the provider of cigarettes that needs to act on his product itself. So you need to impact uh, yeah. for ecological uh, strategy. You need to impact the sources, and the sources is not the country itself. It's the provider. yes, of course, yeah. So maybe did they offer you a job? Yeah, yeah we have to. But it's it's also uh, authorities. We have to convince authorities, but we have also to change the social norm um, about cigarette butts. For example, in in Japan, if when they ban smoking in the street, of course, you will you decrease a lot the littering in the street. So that's an action. Uh, if you, of course, but yes, the littering is a question of social norm, but it's also a question, yes, there is a lot of psychological uh, um, effect. Cultural. Yeah, cultural uh, norm. And very, one very last question is, um, for me, it's interesting, and I didn't really understand um, what is the interest of Philip Morris of you doing the project that you did. So can you put it into, into a context that integrates your employer? Uh, <laughs> it's a question, uh, I think it's a, it's a question of notoriety and responsibility. So Philip Morris is in the market. They, uh, they have to show their notoriety about uh, their responsibility. So if they want to improve their notoriety, they need to, be, to, to, to do everything for littering, uh, pollution, uh, work for uh, child labor, that type, of, that type of stuff. Like it's not only cigarette butt, but they have to act like a responsible company. So, okay. The string is about. It was a, okay, that was a tricky question to, to finish. Uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Maybe if someone wants to, uh, to ask a really last short question, Letitia. Uh, I'm done. It's, it's okay, okay with me. Short question. Short, short question. <laughs> Do you mean that Philip Morris is currently thinking to a strategy to uh, act? At during all the life of the product? Yes, so they have campaigned, for example, on, on the packet. We have, the, the, we have a lot of, in Europe, it's only about the health of the smoker, but now they develop some uh, packaging uh, and innovative packaging for, um, yeah, for the littering, for uh, like in, in the case of anti-campaign, anti-littering campaign. Anti so that's a part of the communication and they finance uh, in view. For, for, for your answers, really. Uh, we extended a bit of time on the questions. Uh, Julie was really curious. 
thank you for, for your presentation, the answers, and, and congratulations on your work. Um, that's, uh, that's concluding the, the session this morning. Uh, for those who want to also follow the session this afternoon, it will be based on, mostly on society. Some of uh, some of the presentation will be classed as confidential. Uh, we'll start with Margar Margarita Inarasuke on the prefeasibility study of a wave power station. Go Benedict Aguto on the analysis of perception of local communities uh, in Cambodia and using uh, smart control data. And Marie Camille uh, Gigi uh, will uh, present her work on fish traceability in a food safety context. Um, thanks a lot again. Thank you, Letitia, uh, for, for your time and for thanks your to feedback you. uh, on what? For your feedback on the on the manuscript and uh, <laughs> on the oral presentations. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> yes, and, and stay, Letitia. Again, it's just we will cut everything. Yeah. Just, can you stay with us, Letitia, a few more minutes for the debriefing? Sure. Thank sure, you, Lionel. No we'll ask you to to leave the Zoom meeting. And maybe uh, hopefully see you uh, tonight. Cheers.